What's causing the high beef prices, in your opinion, and where does the money go? Well, I read an article of not long ago on the beef prices triple from the cattle raiser to the dinner table. I have signed a man right here in my own state of Michigan that had 70,000 bushels of corn and 16,000 bushels of beans, and this man said, I felt I was king of the hill. But you know, he said, I cannot grow corn for 90 cents, and it's time to get together. we got to have a price. I am completely in accord with the NFO theory of uh, all commodity collective bargaining, and I feel that the NFO have the structure, the machinery, to make it work. The family farmer can do a better job and just as efficient a job of producing for the consumer as the corporate farm structure can do. Well, as a housewife and a consumer, I realize that the prices that we receive as farmers have very little, very little to do with what we as consumers have to pay for the finished product in the grocery store. The Secretary of Agriculture of the United States Department of Agriculture has the power to support farm commodities at 90% price supports from storable farm commodities, with the exception of cotton. NFO has found the secret to help all the farmers, help all the farmers. NFO, the space program for agriculture is presented as an NFO public information special. At the marketplace. NFO has found the secret to solve many problems. Solve many problems. Solve many problems. NFO has found Who is getting the consumer beef dollar? The American farmer knows that he is not receiving it because cattle prices are not even what they were in 1952 which is 20 years ago. A study done by USDA marketing specialists shows that beef prices triple from the cattle raiser to the dinner table. NFO News Analyst Phil Allen has the story. Since the whole country is having a debate on the price of beef, we have today a good contribution to a better understanding. It answers the question, who's making the money in the beef industry? We'll hear George Matson of Trimont, Minnesota. He's been a cattle feeder for 20 years. He was Minnesota State President of the NFO for eight years and has traveled most of the western states for the feeder cattle division of the NFO. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, and the midwestern states of Iowa and Minnesota. He's visiting with W.W. Butch Swain, Director of Public Information for the NFO. What's causing the high beef prices, in your opinion, and where does the money go? Well, I read an article, but it's not long ago, on the beef prices triple from the cattle raiser to the dinner table. And I know that I've fed cattle long enough to know that I haven't been making a lot of money, so it kind of concerns me when the people have to pay the kind of price they do nowadays for the meat that they're buying, especially beef. And so I took this article that explained the uh, different prices, what different people had to pay for the beef and what they sold it for and so on and so forth. And according to the figures by Don Kendall, an Associated Press farm writer, I came up from his figures with a calf man, after feeding a cow for a year, makes $45 for a full year's work. Nothing for the labor and nothing in case he loses any other calves, he has to have 100% calf crop in order to get that $45 for a head. And I take and buy that calf at 45 cents a pound or $45 a hundred and add on to the other expenses that I have, the feeding and, and the uh, shots that we have to give him and trucking and so on and so forth. And when I sell that calf to the processor, I make $23.15 for feeding that calf for a full year. Now let's back up just a minute. The calf producer fed the cow for a full year for $45 with nothing for his investment or nothing for his labor. Right. You fed it for another year for $23.15, nothing for your investment or nothing for your labor. This is right, Butch, you bet. The packer, I think, at the present time is making very, very small profit on beef. In fact, I know two or three packers that are talking about closing their beef kill because they can't make any profit. And then the chain store bought that 1,000-pound steer for $340.10. After trimming it away and, and trimming it down to the point where he could sell it to the consumer, he had 439 pounds of beef left that he could sell. And for that 439 pounds of beef, he got $468.40, which is a total profit, gross profit, of $128.30 in one day. 
one day. He sells that steer in about a day's time, right? Right. right. In other words, the farmer that produced the calf received $45 for a full year's work. You received $23 for a full year's work. But the chain store expects to receive $128 for one day's work. This is right. Putting a 27% gross profit, and mine was less than six. Right. And that was on a year basis on mine, and his was on a daily basis. We know that unless we belong to NFO, we've got no possible chance of putting a price on anything. And actually, when we only get less than 5% of the dollar anyway, we could raise our prices. If we could raise ours up to 27% gross like the chain store is getting, why, well, we could have a fair profit. If we don't, and they make $128.30 in one day, and they take over the feeding and the producing of the calf, and they get that much for one day, you can just imagine what it's going to cost the people for food if they figure a whole year's profit in there. So we better keep the family farm out here in production. You have heard George Matson, the Minnesota cattle feeder, who has traveled through cattle country in the United States for the NFO. He was visiting with Butch Swain about who is making the money in the beef industry. George brought out that the cow-calf man who has the animal for a year makes $45. The feeder, who has another year, makes $23.15. But the chain store, in one day of having the beef, makes $128.30. NFO Speaking Bureau is one of the largest in the nation, and one of the most prominent speakers is John Cook, a 1,000-acre farmer from Michigan, who this past winter and spring has toured 25 states. We talked with John by phone and asked him what was the attitude of the people. Sir, I find the farmers uh, really enthused out here. These farmers have found out for the first time that they are financially deep in, in, in a financial problem and that they must get together in order to solve this problem. It is the income that is short here and they begin to realize and so we have a terrific audience out here we have as many times as high as 250 prospective members that are inquiring about joining the NFO. And our collection points, they are participating uh, to terrifically. I, I see where in our edible beans here in Michigan, where we have been instrumental in bringing the price from 650 per hundred weight to $15.15 here last year. And we have started off this year with a floor price of 1040, and we have jacked the price to 1340 thus far. He told us how he explains that NFO is a space program in agriculture. I point out that we had many good organizations, but they were a period in history. They have taught us how to produce better grain, how to feed livestock to perfection in the shortest period of time, and how to get more efficient. But until the NFO come along, the NFO is the spaceship of all these organizations. It is the price tag and the sales department. Therefore, I said our former organizations were like the Mayflower, like the Model T, and like the Wright Brother plane. And the NFO is the spaceship, the locomotive of this train that brings it up to this plateau where we will be financially sound for all of us. John Cook is a dedicated speaker and points out how farmers are joining NFO. I tell you, we sign in many places, we sign farmers today that have anywhere from 500,000 bushel to a million. I have signed a man right here in my own state of Michigan that had 70,000 bushels of corn and 16,000 bushels of beans. And this man said, I felt I was king of the hill. But you know, he said, I cannot grow corn for 90 cents and it's time to get together. We gotta have a price. More and more magazine and newspaper publishers are understanding and writing about NFO collective bargaining. One publisher we just talked with is Dan Crawford of the Spudman Magazine, a trade journal in the potato industry. He told us why he agrees with NFO's all-commodity collective bargaining program. Long before I heard of the NFO, I have advocated an organization or a, a form of what you call collective bargaining. And basically this is the, this is the, the, the fact that growers of, of all commodities get together. So as, as we're all very much aware, agriculture is coming out on the short end of the stick. I do think that the only solution under 
that, that that's possible or that's feasible for agriculture is for enough of them to get together and say, we have food. If you want it, you're going to pay us a reasonable profit for it. And in order to do this, uh, the only structure, the only situation that, that comes uh, to my mind that I feel is possible is, one, uh, the, uh, the NFO contract and system of block selling and collective bargaining on an all-commodity basis over the entire United States, or absolute government controls. And strict government controls are abhorrent to me, and, and, and I'm reasonably sure to most of the other farmers, particularly potato growers. Mr. Crawford recognizes the structure NFO has to get the job done for the American farmer. I am completely in accord with the NFO theory of uh, all commodity collective bargaining, and I feel that the NFO have the structure, the machinery, to make it work. I stated this in 1968 in my magazine, in the editorial uh, part of the magazine, and since then have supported that part of the NFO. In the April issue of Spudman Magazine, Dan Crawford said, This is no time to cut off your nose to spite your face. He also pointed out, sign the contract, and then work together on any of the organization's problems that might appear. On national television, a young NFO County president, along with other representatives, presented a strong case in debating against corporation farming, as Bill Allen reports. There is a program on educational television called The Advocates, which recently took up the question of corporation farming. In the style of courtroom debate, there were several witnesses on each side. Arguing against the corporation takeover were Senator Fred Harris of Oklahoma and his father. There was a young farmer from Creston, Iowa, another from Arkansas, and there was a research man from Washington, D.C. Those arguing for the corporations were Howard Margulies of the Tenneco Corporation, Professor Willard Williams of Texas Tech, and Russell Jekyll, a hog farmer from Delavan, Illinois. We have one of the witnesses who appeared on that educational TV program. He is the farmer from near Creston, Iowa, Joe Weishar. Also, his wife, Mary Jane, is here. We're going to visit with both of them. First, Joe, what did you tell the panel? The message I tried to get across was that the family farmer can do a better job and just as efficient a job of producing for the consumer as the corporate farm structure can do. What do you think should be done, Joe, uh, by farmers, that is? The thing that we have to do first is get a price for our product because the economic situation that we're in right now is going to make it so we're going to lose the battle by default. We're just going to be continually squeezed out one by one. And this is the way agribusiness and the corporate people want it. They want to keep us working on an individual basis. But if we will organize and get our price, then we are going to need protection by the Family Farm Act to keep corporations from coming in and taking over. Well, what is the approach of these corporation structures when they come into agriculture? The integrators can come in and get control of your product by leasing of breeding stock, by uh, leasing of feeder pigs, now, I'd like to give an example. I've got a friend that went into operation to sell feeder pigs for one of the largest feeder pig dealers in, in Iowa, and he was selling pigs, say, two or three hundred head to farmers. And he started to get these large orders for 2,000 to 3,000 pigs. When he finally realized where these pigs were going, there were dealers buying them four packers. They were leasing them to farmers. All the farmer had to supply was his labor and his buildings. He was paid a set rate for raising these feeder pigs, and the packer had control of it, and when the market would start to raise, he could start to draw these pigs in, and he was using this as a lever to hold the market price down. So it's, it's happening at an increasing rate, and it's happening closer to home than we think. I'd like to turn now to Mary Jane Weishar. How does this affect you as a housewife in rural America? Well, as a housewife and a consumer, I realize that the prices that we receive as farmers have very little, very little to do with what we as consumers have to pay for the finished product in the grocery store. 
For example, in uh, 1969 and 1970, the uh, hogs that we sold, we had to take an eight to nine dollar hundredweight cut on the quality meat items in the grocery store. I experienced very little, if any, uh, drop in the same prices. You have heard Joe and Mary Jane Weishar from near Creston, Iowa. Joe appeared recently as one of the witnesses on the educational television program, The Advocates. They told about the threat posed to all America from a takeover of farming by conglomerate corporations. Two presidential candidates, Senator McGovern and Senator Humphrey, have already come out pledging their support for 90% parity on agricultural commodities. They also have stated that the Secretary of Agriculture has the power to enforce 90% parity. NFO reporter Earl Miller visits with W.W. W. Butch Swaim, Director of NFO Public Information, as to how the parity law reads. Butch, what kind of power does the Secretary of Agriculture have in supporting 90% of parity on farm production? The Secretary of Agriculture of the United States Department of Agriculture has the power to support farm commodities at 90% price supports from storable farm commodities, with the exception of cotton. Also applies to, to dairy. Now, he's had this power since 1942. And it's been updated at various times, but since 1954, he's had the power to set it lower. And this is what's caused some people to believe that it's impossible to support him at 90 percent. The law was updated the last time, November the 30th, 1970. Public law number 91-524. What would you say is the solution to our country's total economic problem? Well, first, let's take a look at the record. Failure to maintain raw material prices to balance with wage and capital cost has brought on a huge debt expansion and economic stagnation to our nation. The total combined debt of government, corporations, and individuals in America is now over four times as much as the assessed valuation of all the property in this country. Just the interest on the national debt alone for one year, in the period which ended June 30th, 1971, cost the taxpayers of this nation over $39,000 per minute just for the interest. Now, the choices we have are these. We can continue the underpayment for raw materials and the debt force, the fueled economy that we've had, siphoning the money into the hands of a few until our economy will eventually collapse. Or we can restore raw material prices to balance with wages and capital costs and have prosperity unlimited the American way for all of our American citizens. NFO has found the secret to help all the farmers. Help all the farmers. Help all the farmers. NFO has found the method with a good plan of action for the justice at the marketplace. All new wealth comes from the soil. Underpayment by society for the production of new wealth forces the economy as a whole to operate at a loss. NFO has found the secret to solve many problems. Solve many problems. Solve many problems. NFO has found the secret to solve many problems in the good old USA. Thomas Jefferson said, a country that expects to remain ignorant and free expects that which has never been and never will be. The American people are not uneducated, but we are very uninformed of the facts that are determining our destiny. NFO has found the answer. We must bargain collective. Bargain collective. Bargain collective. NFO has found the secret. We must bargain collective. It's legal and it is fair. One more time. NFO has found the answer. Farmers must sell together. You must sell together. You must sell together. NFO has found the answer. Farmers must sell together. Join the NFO today. Join the NFO today. Yeah. NFO. The Space Program for Agriculture was presented as an NFO public information special 
from the home office in Corning, Iowa, the Farm Bargaining Center of the World.